meet Hiroshi, an absolutely egregious stain on society, with his only feats being an avid bedwetter and professional piss runner. A few years ago, he was his school's ace runner, but after an embarrassing incident, decided to spend his future only running from his problems. And it isn't like he's even bullied about what happened. The people around him adamantly encourage him to move past it. But his bum ass doesn't want to. Instead, he'd rather rot in his room playing RPG games. Because of this, he's become a complete pushover in life, letting any and all of life's problems beat him down deeper in his miserable pit of existence, including, but not limited to, being extorted, being broke after being extorted, being coaxed to spend what he has left on things he doesn't want, being called a pervert by his sister, being reminded that he let his one failure send him into a downward spiral, and finally, getting low diffed by an NPC because his head is too far up his own ass to follow the tutorial. <sighs> so, pretty standard Isakai. Now for some context. Our story takes place in the future, where the market and technology for virtual reality gaming has completely skyrocketed. People are able to fully enter into fresh new worlds and forget about the real one. Fight dragons, go on adventures, bang hot NPCs, the world is your oyster. VR gaming became so advanced that a very specific game caused the entire industry to backtrack. It was hyper-realistic, integrating all five of your senses so you could feel, smell, and taste everything in the game. But a game like that only remained popular for so long. But now, it has one active player again, Hiroshi. Our store girl, Riona, manipulates him into purchasing the game and tells him she'll be his god. It wasn't the game he wanted, sure, but how could he say no to those colossal bazongas? Wow, a game that comes with your own e-kitten. Once he's home, he launches the game and is enamored by its realism and the feel of everything inside. Just like every RPG, his goal is to defeat the Demon Lord and his first objective is to leave the city and reach Flora Castle. He can feel the wind on his skin. He can feel the wood texture of the cottage. He can feel pain! Wait, hold on. Whose fucking idea was that? Everything is realistic, alright. The UI is completely hidden and the NPCs don't even have identifiers. The least realistic part of the game is that he's the main protagonist. Soon, we're introduced to the two NPCs, Alicia and Martin, who are supposed to be his character's childhood friends. They insist that it's time for them to go pick some apples. But Hiroshi would rather skip this part of the story and head to Flora Castle. Um, motherfucker, did you see a skip button on your screen? It ain't gonna be that easy, and Martin and Alicia make that very clear. They try to warn him, telling him the city guard will have his head if he attempts to leave. But, as we've seen before, Hiroshi's only characteristic is hearing out the advice of others and doing the exact opposite of that. If he's gonna leave, he's gotta get past Martin. Martin prepares to run the fade and this is the part of the game that Hiro was waiting for. Bitch! But seriously, what did he think was actually about to happen? Hiroshi gets absolutely floored and Martin just keeps talking sense into him. How the hell could he fend off real enemies if he can't even get past his childhood friend? And after all the L's he took in the real world, that was Hiroshi's final motherfucking straw. He'll be damned if he takes another one from a starting NPC. Are you kidding me? This crash out is about to go down in the history books. And that it fucking did. Hiroshi musters the one point he has in strength and manages to shove Martin to the floor. Yeah, I finally stood up for myself. Now you can stop bitching me. Oh shit, he's dead. Alicia is absolutely horrified. She just watched her childhood friend off her brother with a fruit knife. She ain't gonna recover from that. Hiroshi asks her if she's got those green herbs from Resident Evil 4, but Alicia tells him her brother isn't Leon Kennedy, his name is Martin, and he's fucking dead. Even if it was an accident, he's fucking dead. And y'all know the saying, hell has no wrath like a woman scorned, and Hiroshi better run and run fast before Alicia makes his tutorial on what a real crash out looks like. Well, that fell apart pretty fast. While hiding in an alleyway, Riona finally finds Hiroshi to ask if he's enjoying the peaceful farming simulator. Well, he didn't stop farming else, that's for sure. And if things couldn't get any worse, Riona reveals that your in-game actions grant you titles. So now, everywhere Hiro goes, he will be known as Best Friend Killer. Riona's flabbergasted. She can't believe the person who's supposed to save the world just murdered his best friend in the first 10 minutes. But no worries, from here on out, it only gets worse. Apparently, not only does the game auto save every 5 seconds, but he can't reset either. Everything he does is permanent unless he buys a whole new console. Just like in real life, the only way to restart is to die and be reincarnated. But if we're talking about a hero, he'd be lucky to be born as even a maggot. Just one console is worth 90,000 yen. So yeah, 
Not exactly an option for a motionless high schooler. Anyway, the game is terrible, so he wants a refund. Ariona tells him he already got scammed the moment he got his fingerprints on the case. There are no refunds, Goofy. Otherwise, she'd have to keep coercing new losers into buying the new game. Hero also questions Riona's form. She tells him that's a special perk for shopkeepers. In this form, NPCs cannot see or hear her. Riona is mysteriously obsessed him to continue, so she raises his host by telling him that there are other losers just like him who still play. One of these losers, named Genji, happens to spend all his time in a nearby casino. Since he had the same title of best friend killer, surely he could give Hero some advice on what to do next. But boy does Hero have his work cut out for him. After killing Martin, he's on a perpetual 4 star and the whole town has it out for him. Even the shop merchants. Well, they won't snitch, but he ain't getting a fair price. After being scanned out of his starting money for Kanye's latest drop, Hero and Riona head towards the casino. The only way for Bum to survive is to stick together. But remember how I said, it only gets worse from here? That was an extreme understatement. Alicia found Hero once again, except now she's evolved from Alicia into Hell's Fruit Slicer, the Fruit Knife Wielder from Hell. And she's slicing a very special pair of grapes today. And it turns out that Alicia was supposed to be Hero's love interest, but he completely screwed that up when he crashed out on Martin. So after slicing Hero's Adam's apple, she'll commit seppuku so they can all join Martin in the digital afterlife. Now see if you aren't Hero in this situation, the AI's development, or descent, would be insanely impressive. Like Riona, who while Hero nearly pisses himself, is admiring the programming. Oh yeah, Alicia also has an insane speed stat. Apparently she could have joined Hero's party if he hadn't screwed up the tutorial so badly. Now, Hero must do the only thing he knows how, running from his problems. In case you couldn't tell by now, he's really good at it. Hero barely manages to retreat to a forest where he decides it's finally time to log out of this hellish game. Oh, and what do you know? He can't log out while in combat. Man, the good news just keeps pouring down on him like snow in the Arctic. Alaska, Alicia, is keeping this man on his toes. She lunches at him again and he just barely gets away with a slash on his palm. God damn, this hurt like a bitch! Ariana talking to him like it ain't even supposed to be that bad. But she has f***ing mob power so ain't nobody trying to hear her yap thon Fortunately, Riona realizes she needs to make herself useful. She can't distract Alicia with her melons, so she throws something else in her eyes. Them hands. By God, that probably feels like a bunch of little needles jabbing her irises over and over again. Hiroshi uses that chance to run as fast as he can and finally, he's out. We know that booty cheek was clenched for a solid minute. Hiro wakes up in his gaming chair, wondering why the hell he couldn't just wait like a week to get another allowance for the game he really wanted. Riona texts him in the morning saying she had fun and she's gonna play with him again. We still have no idea why she wants him to play so badly, but she's doing a good job of keeping this scent from thinking clearly. Hero laughs with his best friend about the terrible game he wound up buying. His friend, Takafumi, being the positive influence he is, tells him there's nothing wrong about playing video games as a hobby, but Hero has to start leveling up in real life too. In his first boss fight are the hobgoblins who keep leeching money off of him. He has to set that straight. Hiro really starts to reflect on what his homie said before his sister comes to his room to complain about him screaming every night. Look dude, not everyone wants to be part of your Iron Lobby losing streak. Against Hiro's better judgement, he logs back in. And of course, he returns in the same state he left, bloody hand and all. No auto here, huh? Hiro's not even surprised. He is surprised by the game actually granting him an herb from the beginning. Similar to the coins he had, he finds the herb in his pocket. Finally, an actual video game mechanic for once. Oh, of course it's not that easy. If you ain't a witch doctor in real life, then in this game, a healing herb is as good as a rock to you. And while Hiro has a meltdown about it, another player stumbles upon him. It's Genji, the one they'd been looking for. Thankfully, the fat bozo knows how to use the herb. It's pretty simple, really. All you have to do is grind it in, and it actually is as good as a rock anyway. The herb doesn't do anything. Cuts and bruises in this game take 2-3 to three days to heal, minimum. Hiro is about to, understandably, lose his mind. Are there any actual video game mechanics in this so called video game? Why even call it a healing item if it doesn't heal you? And Genji explains to him, Oh, if you think that's bad, wait till you hear the reason this game doesn't have game menus. I mean, why bother having a character menu when your character doesn't actually have stats anyway? Their in-game characters are direct reflections of their real bodies. The only way to get stronger in-game is to work out in real life. Yeah, 
Hate to break it to the game devs, but anyone who spends half their time bodybuilding or doing martial arts has better things to do than hop on your shitty virtual reality game. I need to know what these game devs were smoking before they dropped this abhorrent excuse of an MMO. They didn't make their game difficult, they made it unplayable! According to Genji, most players were in the same boat as Hiro. Like him, they couldn't even get out of their starting city. Their only semblance of hope is that apparently a whopping total of one player has managed to beat the game. Genji has even seen him himself. The pro player, Kamui, beat the game without ever dying. He has so much ore, it was like witnessing Faker on crack. Hiroshi is a bit more excited that despite the game's bullshit realism and mechanics, there's a way to beat it. He asked Genji to join his party, but as it turned out, Genji was with the law. Hiro learns firsthand why rappers say snitches got the whole hood on fire. 12 is on Hiro like butter on toast, and might as well get a side of fries because he's cooked. And you know what? Just keep adding dirt on the pile. Why not have stoning in your game too? That's real fun. Yeah, the starting town is popular for stoning their players. The stoning gets so intense the mob is even doing some friendly fires. At his wit's end, Hiroshi makes a final gesture of desperation and proclaims himself to be the hero of the world. The guard is like, what the fuck, cringe ass n***a, and then locks him in jail. Well, it was quite the run, but Hito is fed up. He gave the game a second chance, and but it's time to call it quits. And he can't leave. Being in jail counts as an in-game event and prohibits you from logging off. H how spectacular of all the idiotic, bird-brained, injudicious, and inexpedient decisions the devs could have made, what could have behooved them to remove the one thing that players should have control over? The one thing. The option to not play the game. He's hungry, he's injured, and his bladder is killing him. And to make matters even worse, and at this point, I sound like a broken record, but it keeps getting worse. Hito is being haunted by the ghost of Martin, the NPC he killed, allegedly. Because physical and mental abuse wasn't enough, the devs decided to just close the gap and go psychological too. Martin vows to haunt the poor bastard until he remembers what they promised to each other under the Kanura tree. Hito, she literally can't muster anything coherent, nor does he even have any knowledge of their promise. So until he figures it out, Martin screams, it's time for your favorite sitcom, Martin! Oh god no, Hiro yells for help, help me, he's feeling romantical! Like an angel descending from heaven, a red-headed girl runs down the corridor to answer Hiro's cries. With her arrival, the haunting ends, and the fun begins. She releases him from his cell and has Hiro follow her to another room. Once they reach the suspiciously barren room, Hito receives a very vague message asking if he's mentally prepared for some intense simulation. And is anyone really surprised this idiot press yes? How down bad do you have to be to think you're gonna get head after being arrested for murder? Rest in peace brother, the redhead is as sadistic as the people who developed the game. Now he has two choices, endure the torture of having his limbs severed or confess. If he endures, he'll be set free, otherwise he'll serve a 10 year sentence. Hiroshi's only response is, so no head? Finally, the only reason Hiro is even playing this dog water arrives. It's Riona. Her reason for being late is reasonable at least. She couldn't miss the Counter-Strike Championships for his sorry ass, but no need to worry. She can now roleplay as his personal cheerleader. Hooray! Who's excited to get his leg chopped off like a turkey on Thanksgiving? Hiro is! The only one more excited than him is Mizarisa the girl doing the chopping. His crying is only making her cream harder, but to everyone's shock, Mizarisa isn't the only one in the room wetting her pants. No, Hiroshi beat her to the punch. Hiroshi was the first player to ever piss themselves in the game's history, and by some stroke of luck, peeing herself as a cheat to escape the interrogation room. A soldier immediately comes in and orders for Hiroshi's release. Mizarisa feels like she's been blue-balled, but Hito is set free. Without even wasting a breath, he does what anyone in their right mind would have done and logs off. And Ryota needs to fix her face. I can surprise this man isn't having fun after the hell he's been through. Once Hiroshi awakes from the game, we learn that pissing himself actually resurfaced his buried trauma, the reason why he doesn't race anymore. It was his first year in high school, and wow, Hiroshi actually looks like someone who demands respect here. He's a track running prodigy, one of the best in his region. What in the world could have possibly caused this downfall? His little sister is so proud of him that she brags about him to his friends. It's only his first year in high school and a plethora of scouts and recruiters have arrived to watch the event. 
Even an Olympic silver medalist, Mike McLaughlin, spoke to Hiroshi personally about the event. Dude had everything lined up for him. Well, well, everything except the way to the bathroom. Instead of using the bathroom, he spent his time talking to McLaughlin, which resulted in him tripping, losing the race, and, you guessed it, pissing himself. And he cussed that boy deep. He's so embarrassed that he vows to never race again. Talk about fragile. His sister attempts to cheer him up, but he shuts her out. He'd rather wallow in his own self-pity than move on. He messed up in front of THE McLaughlin, who apparently came to speak to Hiroshi again. Hiroshi tries to explain himself, but Mike makes it obvious he's not disappointed in the outcome of the race, but Hiro's attitude about it. Unfortunately, Mike might as well be speaking Spanish. Instead of reflecting on what Mike could have been trying to tell him, he just quits. And we end up where Hiro is today. A solemn and worthless loser. His sister can't stand the sight of him. His advisor can't even have a conversation with him. His only friend can't even reach out to him. Even his bullies are shocked at his complacency. He's done with the game, and it makes his sister even more frustrated. You already quit running to play video games. At the very least, commit to that, you worm. Hito ends his day at Riona's since he plans to return the game to her. Riona doesn't take him seriously, and why should she? Because he immediately caves in when she seduces him again. Hiroshi is so easily swayed by his virginity that he can't even commit to quitting now. Riona informs him that Soichiro Kamui, the only person who ever beat the game, actually made a walkthrough guide for it. She also lets it slip that she too thinks the game is a piece of crap but changes the subject before Hiro can even pry into it. The walkthrough is abusive, but it's got useful information. There's a guide for every situation, including what to do if your childhood friend is trying to kill you. And no one questions how he knows the trick to beating every path when each player can only have one storyline. Kamui's main point is to train physically. The only difference between a skinny loser and a fat loser is who can outrun their problems. His second main point is to be crafty. It doesn't matter if you're muscular or bony if you're an idiot. In addition, Alicia is quite literally what happens when you give the UK an Elden Ring boss. Unless you're Jackie Chan, you're better off just laying down to die. Kamui vaguely explains the only real way to win is without fighting. It's a shame Hiro is just too many cards short of a deck to understand that information. Or anything else Kamui explains. So with barely a change of plans, our poor simp logs back in. Still drenched in piss, the city guard presses him to get a move on. He's been called by Tesla, the captain of the city guard. But not before Miserisa, our executionist, clings to the piss-drained sheets like a sentimental trophy. Turned out his riz fell so far into the negatives that it multiplied itself like cursed energy and won the heart of the NPC. After some time, Hiroshi meets the guard captain of the city, Captain Tesla. He offers Hiroshi a Michelin star meal before apologizing for wrongly imprisoning him. Apparently, it's not entirely plausible to shove a fruit knife through someone's throat like a kebab. And since there are no signs of it being premeditated, Hito has been acquitted of his crimes. Wow, looks like things are finally looking up for Hiro. Oh, and so are the rocks. Holy shit, they're famous for stonings for a reason. Even though Hito has been forgiven by the law, the townsfolk were fresh out of fucks and want blood spilled for Martin. Yet Marcin Martin must have been a fucking saint for the townsfolk to be crashing out over him this much. So it's back to hiding again. Riona suggests that in order to deal with Alicia, they should buy some smoke bombs. And that's it. Her whole plan is to just throw a smoke bomb and pray to God that Alicia doesn't simply walk through it. Before they can even consider putting that plan into action, Hero needs money. There's only three ways to earn money in KQ. Work, borrow, or steal. And despite everything Hiroshi's already gone through, Riona's first resort is to steal. Which is really starting to call into question whether she's actually trying to help him or not. Thank God, Hiro's pattern recognition is capable enough to not listen to our tomfoolery. So their next option, back alley indeed, which falls apart when Hiro discovers the nature of the jobs, either work at a power plant for two months or whip an old man until he busts. Not happening. Our last option is to borrow. And who else do we know in the town who won't immediately try to kill us other than Genji? Apparently, Riona and Genji are already familiar with each other. They strike up conversation and Riona wastes no time sharing every embarrassing thing that has happened to Hito. Hito starts getting tight, but restrains himself since he needs the money. But not only does Genji refuse to give them anything, but takes the liberty of calling Kiro piss boy. Uh oh folks, looks like we're in crash out territory again. 
Stick Boy Hito normally wouldn't be able to compete with Genji, but Genji's too drunk to really fight back. And their rage, the two start to go at it. And at every moment, Riona keeps yapping about some nonsense that only serves to distract Hito. Thankfully, Genji's gout kicks in, making him even more vulnerable. But Hito misses the chance to capitalize when Ma'an abruptly begins to broadcast again. In fear, Hito cowers into a corner, praying for mercy. Ma and Tom didn't last long, but it struck fear in the twink's heart. Genji recognizes what happened and assures him that he'll eventually get over it. Martin Tom managed to spook the fight out of Hiro, and he apologizes to Genji. Genji apologizes in the same manner and passes out in his seat. Riona, taking advantage, declares that Genji should fork over what he has since Hiro won the mutual combat. Genji just takes the L and gives away his money. Hiro knows they're virtually stealing from the junk bastard, but it's an evil world we live in. At least that had a better result than if he had robbed the elderly couple. He probably would have gotten an elderly burglar title or something. Oh, he did anyway. Well, now he's got the bag, but he's not done yet. Hiroshi needs to complete his side objective, which is to buy smoke bombs for some reason. And now he reaches a fork in the road. A grueling decision. Does he enter the shabby, worn down shop or the very blatant bait for virgin otakus? <sighs> Surely one day he'll start thinking with the head on his shoulders. Well, what do you know? He gets scammed out of all his money and he only gets away with two smoke bombs. His next mission? Return home and retrieve his sword. According to Kamui, everyone gets one when they first start out, but Hiro was too busy trying to leave to notice. Hiroshi reaches his old house, and it's just devoid of life and joy. It's like he walked into the insidious set. Hiro finds the sword, but before he can retrieve it, emerges Alicia from the shadows. She'd always been two steps ahead, and now she's got him right where she wants him. Alicia's looking more and more zombified by the day. In a panic, Hito throws the first smoke grenade. Nothing happens. Guess he never noticed how the grenades have a fuse that needs to be lit first. Alicia is offended at his stupidity. He pulls out the second grenade, but oh wait, he doesn't have a lighter to begin with. He was better off tossing his coins into a river and praying to the sea gods for protection. And protection does indeed arrive. In a blazing fury, the one to come to Hero's rescue is none other than Mizarisa. Mizarisa asserts that since Captain Tesla absolved Hero of his crimes, then any violence taken against him is practically treason. But Alicia has as many fucks to give as the moon has oceans. Oh, and if you were wondering why Mizarisa is even here, she's been stalking him. Or more specifically, tracing the smell of his piss throughout the city. Yeah, Hito's been walking in his piss all day. I guess he's pretty used to it. Hito's just glad he finally has someone on his side. That is until Mizarisa explains that she's only invested in seeing him piss himself during another torture session. Looks like the grass was burnt on the other side. The battle between the two acoustic women begins. The two of them are evenly matched with Mizarisa having the edge in strength, while Alicia has the upper hand in speed. Despite her featureless stature, Mizarisa's putting up a really good show, and easily makes a display of her experience over Alicia. Mizarisa announces how the only way she loses some country bumpkin is if it was some fantasy video game. Oh, and she lost it. Damn! She had to hit her with the Tatsumaki Sampuken! Alicia is clearly what happens when you take AI off its reins. Your video game becomes the ring. She's ascended to the point where she can even detect Riona and protects her eyes this time. Your seven days are up, runner boy. As Alicia closes in on Hito, he remembers Kamui's advice. Fight without fighting. What is the one thing that would cause any childhood friend to reconsider killing you? Think, Hiroshi. Think. What could possibly make Alicia not want to slit your throat right now? Committing sexual assault. Really, you know? Alicia can't even fathom how hopelessly brain rotted he is. For once, for f just five minutes, stop thinking about Snoo Stew and make a rational decision. Alicia brings the version loser to his knees with a kick that wasn't even half her full power. It's looking grim for Hiroshi, folks. But before we even reach our climax, we have a special guest appearance. That's right, it's my end. Alicia can feel my end spirit cheering her on. It's Hiro's last chance. The kick to the gut was just enough to reboot his system. Hiro rubs his last two brain cells together and finally figures out what Kamui's riddle really meant. With everything on the line, Hiro she clutches with a confession of love. It stops Alicia dead in her tracks. She asks him what he could mean by saying that all of a sudden, and he doubles down. He loves her. He wants to marry her. He wants to carry her children. 
The sudden psychological damage makes her drop her knife. But it's not enough. Or not enough to be forgiven. Alicia screams that it's too late to pull this. Not only did he kill her brother, but he ran away. Can you imagine your best friend of like 20 years just murdering your mom or dad then ghosting the scene without so much as an apology? Hero tries to fall back on the fact that Martin's death was an accident, but in reality, the entire situation could have been avoided if he hadn't tried to leave the city. If he had just stopped to listen for two seconds, Martin wouldn't have had to fight him. If his head had been so far up his ass, he could have avoided all the trouble he went through. And then it finally clicks. Hiroshi realizes what he's been missing this entire time is accountability. Alicia doesn't know what to do with Hito and she rushes out of the shed. Meanwhile, Hiroshi tries a new skill for the very first time, self-reflection. Ever since he first opened KQ, he's treated it like an average video game and expected everything to revolve around him. Just like in real life, he never assumes that he could be at fault for the things that happened to him. Perhaps the game being so realistic was intentional. It makes you forget that you're playing a game because you're supposed to forget that it's a game. When you treat it like a game, that's when the punishment starts. So, it's about time he changed his approach. Hiroshi asks Riona where he can find the Kanura tree. There, he admires his beauty until Martin makes his reappearance. To Martin's surprise, Hito isn't afraid of him anymore. Now that he's standing face to face with who was supposed to be his childhood friend, Hito isn't sure how to apologize. Camille was right after all. Hito is only in this situation because he's a worthless maggot. But the answer is obvious. Instead of pushing Martin away, he asks Martin to join him. The moment Hito does this, the promise between Martin and Hito is finally revealed. Hito is transported back in time to when the three of them were kids. Under the Kanura tree, Martin claims to always forgive Hito because they're friends. But they's more than friends, Hito proclaims. They's best friends. Best friends forever. Hito repeats the promise to Martin in the present, and it finally releases his soul. Hito's upset because he doesn't want him to leave now that he's finally accepted him. But that ain't how it works. Every good show, including Martin, must come to an end. Afterwards, Riona meets up with Hiroshi again and wonders how in the hell he can just walk around in the crust of his piss for so long. Hiroshi agrees that he'll get a change of pants back in the town. When they arrive, they're shocked to see the entire town in chaos. Houses are burning and people are panicking. They all rush to evacuate and no one cares enough to explain to Hiro what's going on. Well, guess it isn't that important. Turns out, never seeing any action not only dries up your little sword, but it rusts your actual sword too. So. Hiro enters the blacksmith shop to ask for his sword to be polished. The blacksmith asks if he was jumped on his head as a baby because who would think this is the right time to conduct business as usual? Hiro asks just what exactly is going on then. It's a goblin attack! The first in decades now that the moat has dried up. Hiro can do whatever he wants, he's skedaddling. Hiroshi actually takes the time to start polishing the blade as people outside are murked and massacred. Now he sees why the blacksmith assumed he was sped. Hito rushes out to add something other than a human to his kill count, but Riona stops him. The goblins in this game aren't the ones to be tested. Without proper game knowledge, Hiroshi will die. Not might, not probably, definitely. And Riona realizes it's about time she reveals what happens if you die in game. Another major reason why the game fell off and was met with such harsh criticism is because if you die in game, not only you, but your console will be cooked too. As if Hiro needed any other reason to believe that KQ was a downright plague to society, Riona bluntly admits that the game is dog water, which really calls into question why she's so motivated for Hiro to beat it. The two agree that Hiro should log out and come back after watching a few more walkthroughs, but Hiro wants to get a good look at a goblin before he goes. And holy shit, that's a face only a mother could love. Yeah, Hiro's chilling on that. That is, until he spots a defenseless child on the same street as the goblin. Even though she's just an NPC, Hero's name wouldn't be worth a damn if he walked away now. It's time to get some street cred. Riona continues to drag him back, explaining that those goblins don't bring problems that Hero wants. But Hero's done running. Even if it means death, he won't let anyone else die. After hearing such conviction, what else can Riona say except label him a pedophile? Rich coming from her. Before they can make a decision, the city guard arrives to handle the goblin. 
Looks like Hero will not to do anything at all. The goblin doesn't waver though. No, he displays just exactly why the goblins run this hood. I'm not stuck in here with y'all, y'all stuck in here with me. In a flash, the goblin makes sure the soldiers will never be able to hold their loved ones again. The goblin catches two bodies before Hero can even blink. Why is this the first enemy you have to get past? Hero wonders. Riona explains to him that most of the players who managed to get as far as leaving Ted avoided the goblins entirely. Only two players really stood a chance against them, Kamui and the professional boxer Shohei. That doesn't mean anything to Hiroshi though. The little girl is in danger. So, Riona devises a plan to distract the goblin while Hiro runs past to rescue her. The smoke bombs would have actually come in handy here. But before they execute the plan, Hiro needs to at least change his pants first. Either Hero changes in sub 3 seconds or changing equipment pauses the game. One or the other. He changes while the goblin admires his next snack. The two rush out of the shop. Riona distracts the goblin with a rock while Hero makes use of his one and only skill, running. He sprints towards the girl and picks her up. The mission goes a lot better than anyone could have expected, until a second goblin appears. Now, Hero and the girl are surrounded. Hero realizes he was just too in over his head. He sets the girl down, lamenting on his lack of ability to make a difference. That's when he sees his little sister in the girl. The innocence and hope in the girl's eyes are enough to make Hero remember his conviction. He's tired of getting little broed. He's tired of being a disappointment. He's tired of giving up. In a last ditch effort, he tells the girl to run down an alley as fast as she can. The goblin swings and Hero rolls out of the way in fear, not realizing he'd already cleared the path for it. The goblin chases the child and Hero rises up again to follow suit. They are a good distance away, and Hero has to dig deep, really fucking deep. He's got the form, that boy running like an athlete. Come on, Hito, he yells to himself. They haven't been taking me seriously for seven fucking episodes. They don't know me, son. Who's going to carry the boats and the oars? Hero is. Hero does flash better than the DCEU has been in a decade. In a split second, he manages to save the girl with his insane speed. And just in the nick of time, Captain Tesla pulls up to the scene looking like Eskimo's abandoned child. Tesla obliterates the goblins in an instant. At the same time, the city guard arrives to escort the young girl. Hero also earns a new title, Lollicon. Okay, seriously? What was he supposed to do, let the kid die? Despite Hero not doing much to change the situation, without him, the young girl would have been killed. Tesla acknowledges Hero's bravery and recruits him into the city guard as a mercenary, to which Hero immediately accepts. The next day, Hiro tells Takafumi about the game and his friend notes how the game may have helped change him for the better. He's not an insufferably pitiful emo kid anymore. Still pitiful, but not insufferable. While he's on the road to being an armchair psychologist, he points out to Hiro that people really only complain about the things they love the most. There's a possibility that the game has grown on him. That night, Hiro decides to check the guys a bit more before logging back in. There were actually a few options for surviving the oncoming goblin raid. The first is to round up at least 100 NPCs with still only a 10% chance of survival. The second is to just hide, which somehow has less of a survival chance. Finally, the absolute worst option with no chance of survival, fight alongside Tesla. Not all hope is lost though. Apparently, having the title of best best friend killer, which can only be obtained from figuring out Martin's promise, makes Hito's chances slightly higher. From absolutely impossible to horrendously impossible. It'll take Hito to be fully locked in to make it out of this one. But if he does, and if he continues using his brain, he'll discover the secret behind the starting town. All he has to do for now is last through five days of grueling training in the army camp. But before he logs back in, Hito approaches his sister's room. He's learned to be mindful of others, and although he can't promise not to scream, he can at least pre-fire an apology. Kaede, dumbfounded by a sudden switch up, just dismisses him. Hito returns to the game and follows Tesla. As they walk through the city, Hito hears the cries of prisoners from the jail. That's one way to keep your citizens in check. Soon they arrive at the castle where Hito meets Queen Govern, and she makes sure to get very familiar. Come on Hito, we must stay focused. Later, Hito and Tesla arrive at the camp where all Hito has to do is survive for five days when the next goblin attack starts. And surviving is really the best he can do. Off rip, Hiroshi's lack of skill, strength, 
and overall usefulness is displayed in front of the entire army. The instructor, Amos, was actually the original guard who arrested Hito. He has zero tolerance for Hiro even being there and neglects him. Not only does the entire city guard give up on Hito, but two other mercenaries, Granada and Palu, start picking on him. There is a girl named Kathy who treats him nicely, but that's about the only star in this black hole of an experience. She teaches him how to hold a sword, but he forgets it by the next day. Hito's public humiliation just continues. He gets beat up, extorted, ostracized, oh, and cucked. Yeah, Kathy turns her back on him once she's asked if they're friends or not. Can't blame her. This is the life of a down bad loser. It's a video game, but it's playing out exactly like his real life. Finally, Riona feels bad enough for Hito that she takes matters into her own hands. Riona's next diabolical plan, framing. The next day, Granada's most precious items turn up missing. His boots and sword wind up in the shitter, and no one knows how. Granada tries to blame Hito, but the other guards vouch for him. It was quite literally impossible for Hiro to do it. Then the nurse lady's panties are found in Granada's locker. Granada's got a very serious case building up against him. He lashes out at the nurse, but the rest of the city guards shut that shit down fast. Man, if Tess Lane got your back, it's very hard to prove your innocence. After facing allegations in an even worse way than Hiro did, he quits. Which leaves just two ops, Amos and Palu. So how did Riona deal with them? At the training ground, the king himself, Tesla, arrives at the scene. He bears a note accusing Amos of stealing Granada's gear. And as we've learned in this town, guilty until proven innocent. Jesus, it's like the Salem witch trials all over again. The rest of the core buy into the allegations since Amos was clearly jealous of Granada's strength. They also hate Almost because he doesn't even teach them. Oh, and guess who the letter was written by? Palu, of course! Man, we have enough framing here to build a few bookshelves. Tesla admits that although there isn't any solid evidence to prove he stole Granada's belongings, his reputation was further in the gutter than where they were found. So, he's dismissed. Riona applauds herself for being an Olympic gold medalist instigator. But since the game can't punish Riona, it punishes Hiro with a new title diabolical and spiteful so she framed not one not two or three but four people nothing's changed and hero doesn't feel any more prepared for the goblin assault he's already gotten this far though might as well see it through rona commends him for his bravery and his resolve so she finally decides to open up about why she searched so hard for another person to beat the game hero was under the assumption that she was capping when she claimed she'd marry whoever beat the game at the kamui but no she was being dead ass her motivation? 10 years ago when she was still a high schooler. Damn, 10 years? That age gap is not helping your case, you harlot. Anyway, when the game was still popular, Riona was also a regular player. By some stroke of luck, she ran into Kamui in-game. Thirsty for clout, she asked Kamui to go out with her. Kamui takes one look at her and sends her back to the trade routes where she belongs like a G. If you don't get the fuck out my face, bitch, don't you be like a damn One Piece character with them jugglers. How the fuck are you even standing up straight? You need to go get them things pumped before you poke somebody's eye out from breathing too damn hard. Why, why am I even talking? Get the fuck off, man. That roast has lived rent-free in her head ever since. Not only did he flame her, but he went on to beat KQ. Like most women, since Kamui didn't send for her and became successful, she only became more obsessed. So, she vowed that she'd find someone else to beat KQ, marry them, then make out with them in front of Kamui. Totally not batshit idea. While up on a watchtower, Hito is joined by Tesla. The two share a heartfelt moment about wanting to leave the city. But Tesla is obligated to remain within the walls since he's the guard captain and the threat of goblins still looms around. So Hiroshi asks him to leave the city with him once the assault is over. Tesla tells him he'll consider it. Yeah, death flags waving everywhere. Hiroshi immediately checks the guard to make sure Tesla doesn't die. And after awaking to discover his sister stalking him while he's in REM sleep, Proofs to Kamui that he did surpass the mercenary trial. Kamui reveals to him the trick to beating KQ. It's apparently so simple that Kamui doesn't even let him view it for longer than 10 seconds. Then the page closes on its own. Well, that's it. He had a logs back in, fully prepared for it to be his last. Back in the game, Tesla announces the arrival of two more mercenaries. Can't be too bad to have more support, Hiro believes. <laughs> it's Alicia and Mizurisa. Well, on the bright side, Alicia has returned to looking like a normal person and not something that crawled out of Resident Evil. Oh, 
I take that back. <laughs> well, who better to ask for protection than the people who want your corpse all to themselves? Of course, Tesla assigns the two bloodthirsty hounds to Hito. Their next mission is to dissolve as much chaos in the city as they can before the goblins attack. There have been multiple reports of thieves and burglaries occurring, so it's up to the city guard to put an end to it. Mizurisa makes her distaste of Alicia very clear. She wants Hito all to herself, The hero doesn't want either of them. Suddenly, a robbery happens directly in front of them. The dude runs right through Hiro despite having all the space in the world to go around, so our little orange cat of a childhood friend proceeds to cut his hand off, and Hiroshi decides to return the purse with the hand still attached to it? Like she's, want, like she's gonna want it as a souvenir or something. Next, Mizurisa does what she does best, interrogation. What could have possessed the man to turn to a life of crying right before goblins attacked? So the thief explains how nothing will matter since they're all gonna die anyway. Turns out, there's a mastermind behind all the crime sprees in the city. Since the dude ain't built for prison life, he snitches on where they can find him. The casino. The inside of the casino looks like a GTA heist. Multiple NPCs are being held hostage, including the player who never leaves, Genji. Hito is surprised to see someone like him tied up, since he should be fairly strong. While Hito unties the hostages, Alicia and Mizurisa make swift work of the rest of the thugs. After absolutely blowing the back out of the biggest guy, he turns to Genji and reveals that Genji was actually the leader. Not a single NPC can keep their mouth shut. So before Hito can react, Genji gets him in a chokehold. Genji threatens Alicia and Mizurisa not to move. Genji's entire motivation was to earn a bit more cash to fuel his gambling addiction while the goblins attacked. Hito is so sick of hearing about this man's pathetic life choices and getting choked out by this geezer, he elbows him in his gut to break free. Before Mizurisa and Alicia can make a move though, Hito calls Iso. He wants to run the ones himself. After all, Genji's the reason Hito ended up in jail, so it's only fair that he returns the favor. Diona starts gushing at the faded battle between the last two active users of KQ. Genji fights as dirty as his hygiene. He pulls out two knuckle braces this time. Hito could care less if they were barbed and laced with dog piss. The two rush at each other in what might be the craziest mid-off of the century. But Alicia doesn't have the patience for it. She one-shots Genji hard enough to knock the gout out of him, and it ends there. The guards arrive shortly after and arrest everyone. Hito has his final dialogue with Genji, who congratulates him for overcoming his original oopsies and making it pretty far in the game. Before he's taken away, they hear the benumbed cries of the prisoners from within the jail again. Hito tells Genji he should reevaluate his life choices, which is rich, since it hasn't even been a full 24 hours since he had his own character development. Genji reminds him that he's too old for that kind of pep talk, and some people just stay stuck in their ways. Tesla arrives and congratulates Hiroshi for a job well done, but all of a sudden, the goblins have finally started their raid. Finally, the pinnacle of everything Hiroshi has been waiting for. He endured so much pain, so much suffering. He went from being accused of murder to fighting alongside Tesla. At long last, he has his blade, his friends, his big titty cheerleader, and diarrhea. Oh, the nerves get to him. Just like that fateful day on the track, and he immediately runs for the stall. After finally relieving himself in something other than his own pants, Hiroshi discovers he was being watched. It's elementary school all over again. Hiroshi screams at the top of his lungs, but the goblin is quickly decapitated. Not only was he being stalked by a goblin, but Mizurisa. No matter where Hiro runs, she can trace his piss to the edge of the world. Inside, Mizurisa does a quick punk test by poking Hiro with his own sword. He cries out, wondering why she is the way she is. And yep, those are the cries she's been missing. Now that they're alone, Mizurisa suggests they should just forget about the goblin raid, and Hiro should try raiding something else. That is until Alicia interrupts them. The two psychopaths are prepared to clash again, but Hiro exclaims that they need to go help Tesla. The three arrive at the front lines of the battle. This time, goblins are raiding in full military fashion. After a brief speech, Tesla leads the charge against the goblins. The battle begins, and the only people who are able to hold their own are Tesla, Mizurisa, and Alicia. They're holding their own very well. At the rate they're going, Hiro could have stayed home. Nikola Tesla just keeps spamming the same skill while Alicia practices all the moves she wished she could have used on Hiroshi. The battle concludes with an overwhelming victory, but the next begins when Squirrel Girl arrives. She reports that the southern gate was busted into and that the castle is being invaded. Tesla notes that there's only one goblin that could have broke through the iron wall. 
and its name is One Eye. Those who can still fight, including Hiro, rush to the castle to find the Red Hulk turning the guards into doormats. Tesla tells Hiroshi that One Eye is in fact the King of the Goblins. If they can defeat him, the goblin raids will stop, and there will be peace in the valley once more. But beware, not even Tesla is confident in his ability to defeat him. Last they fought, Tesla barely managed to escape after turning two eyes into one eye. Tesla orders his men to bring the cage. It's unclear what the cage does, but surely it'll aid in their victory. So until it arrives, all Tesla needs to do is stall for time. In regards to Alicia and Miserisa, the stars align just right for them to achieve an understanding. Neither of them will allow Captain Tesla to fall out the hands of a goblin. Now it makes sense why Kamui said Hiro's chances of success would be slightly higher if he made up with his childhood friend. Both Miserisa and Alicia are powerful allies. Miss Anorexia rushes in first and One Eye pulls out some Gumu Gumu no technique to swat her little ass into next week. Alicia jumps in next and all three of them begin, what the f***? Okay, it makes sense for the final boss to have a little speed on him, but that big brolic motherfucker has no business bouncing around the map like that. Hiro and Riona can't even comprehend what's going on. As the fight continues, the cage finally arrives. Tesla's major scheme is finally unveiled, for inside the cage are three pubescent goblins. Oh, so that's the type of beat we're on today, Hiro thinks. The sight causes one eye to pause just long enough for Tesla to get a good hit in. One Eye falls to the ground and Tesla claims victory. The event is finally over, and Hito didn't have to raise a finger. Kamui really made Hito worry when he told him his chances of success were slim to none. But then again, would Kamui really exaggerate if it were that easy? All of his other advice had been pretty spot on. Hito's not taking shit for granted anymore and locks in. That's when the cries of the goblins start to sound a bit too familiar. He's heard those cries come from the prison on multiple occasions. Wait a minute, something ain't right. After all, using children as hostages, goblins or not, is definitely not the music Hito expected from Tesla. Right before Tesla beheads One Eye, Hito yells for him to stop. He ain't exactly comfortable with the energy in his studio today, so Tesla has some explaining to do. First of all, Tesla stated that the goblins were newly captured, but their skin is paler than Dracula himself. They've been waiting to see the sun like it was the return of Joy Boy. He's been hearing their cries from the prison since he first booted up the game, meaning they were captured a long time ago. And the only person who can manage that is Tesla. Riona's brain is too smooth to even consider what Hero is saying. If he could jump that far to conclusions, he should have tried out for a long jump, not a hundred meter. But she's interrupted by Tesla beheading the Goblin King as ominously as possible. Then hits him with... Well, good job, Phoenix, right? And here I thought you were just a horny monkey with no innate talent whatsoever. Yes, Tesla did kidnap the goblin children. In fact, they were actually one eyes. Not only that, but the threat of goblins was just one massive conspiracy all along. The goblins are actually a highly intelligent and peaceful race. Tesla and Queen Govern have just been provoking them in order to keep the citizens bound to the city. If no one comes and no one goes, the city remains completely independent of all the other nations. So as it turns out, Hiro does have a talent. The ability to consistently fuck himself over. Since he figured out their secret, everyone has to die. In a flash, Tesla offs his own men before they can even process the story. Oh, and just to rub more salt on the wound, Tesla's been holding back the whole time. So, the real reason the storyline had what Kamui called a 0.1% survival chance is because of Tesla. Now the only way Hito's going to be leaving the city is through Heaven's Gates. Tesla's special move, Lightning Extreme, has an even higher version with less startup frames called Lightning Extreme Despair, which is how he's decided to kill Hiroshi. A lovely parting gift. In a flash, Tesla dashes towards Hito and Hito prepares to not only experience the most agonizing death imaginable, but the death of his console too. Just then, Right before Tesla turns Hito into a lightning kebab, Alicia jumps in between them. The blade pierces her abdomen and her body falls to the ground. Hito can't fathom it. He rushes to her side and asks why she saved him instead of prioritizing her own life. Alicia reveals that Martin's spirit had spoken to her in a dream and told her to forgive Hito. That's why she joined the guards, to protect him. Although the pain of losing her brother was still fresh, she still loved Hito. As her code reaches its final run, Alicia tells Hito how happy she was to know he loved her. 
and she's gone. Hito already knows the answer, but he still asks Fiona if there's any way to bring an NPC back to life. She tells him there isn't. So Hito tells her, bet, that means there's no way in hell for Tesla to come back either. With conviction burning in his eyes, this will be Hito's single greatest crash out. Tesla uses his lightning extreme despair once more, but this time, Hito avoids it. Tesla is stunned, but perhaps he just miscalculated. Tesla spams the attack again. Hito parries it. Now Tesla's just wondering, I right, what in the plot convenience? Tesla can't fathom how Hito has gone from not even being able to hold a sword to deflecting lightning extreme despair. It's simple. He's locked in. The final trick that Kamui revealed to him is a characteristic that Hiro had been missing his entire life. It's a trait that's underused in both the real world and in game. It's what everyone in his life has been telling him to do. Don't give up. When you don't give up, just like in real life, your body breaks its perceived limits and you achieve things you didn't know you could. And in KQ, this is heightened to a stupid degree. All it takes Hiro is believing in himself and his stats skyrocket. Just like that, he's able to keep up with Tesla. Riona watches in awe as Hiro takes a page out of Annie's lobby Luffy and goes gear two on his ass. Hiro is moving just like Kamui did all those years ago. <laughs> she can't wait to groom him some more. After role playing as the Tasmanian Devil, Hiro finally disarms Tesla and jams his blade right into his armor. Only to discover why people wear armor in the first place. The blade not only fails to pierce, but snaps like a twig. Well, at least he tried. Tesla uses the force to get his blade again and prepares to slash Hito for the final time. Hito, she complains, and Tesla takes his final swipe at Hito. It's over. In what appears to be the KQ afterlife, Hito meets Martin again. They greet each other, and Hito copes with losing his life to Tesla, then apologizes because he wasn't able to protect Alicia. Martin tells Hito he's already forgiven. After all, he fought his heart out, but the fight isn't over yet. It's about time Martin joined Hito. Only this time, Hito has no clue what Martin's going on about until he returns to the mortal realm with his blade transformed into a cursed one. The cursed energy coming off the blade is so powerful that it shatters Tesla's. The two gear up for round two as Tesla draws his spare blade. Tesla charges up his final move, Lightning Extreme Ultima. Riona frets, but now that he's got some cursed energy, Hito hits him with, nah, I'd win. The two charge at each other once more. Hito can see his movements as clear as day. What he didn't see was Queen Govern sneaking up right behind him. In the end, he lost. As expected, his console was completely toasted. But if there's any hope at the end of this decrepit tunnel, it's that they know how to beat the game now. Riona believes in him so much, in fact, and she wants to give him an entirely new console and game for free. It's great news. But when Hito realizes he'll be starting all over again from scratch, it's kind of demotivating. Although his gameplay was absolutely hellish, he doesn't want everything he went through, including the setbacks he had to overcome, to just be erased. That's when Hito notices a new tip on Kamui's website. If you got as far as fighting Tesla, dying, and still want to play, there is a chance to recover your progress. It's a tight window, but if he repeats a bunch of gibberish with the old game in his new console, he could return to an hour before he died. Not sure how that'll affect the space time of the game for other players who are online, but fuck it. Lastly, Hito is still unsure of how Kamui has so much knowledge of all these game paths and even how to restart your game. Like, why would he need to know that if he never died? Hiroshi is willing to play again, but first, he's gotta step up his game. He asked Riona to give him a month to prepare. In the meantime, he's returned to exercising. He finds it ironic that it took a video game to get him to start working out again, but at least he's doing it now. Not only that, but he's regained the respect of his peers, including his sister. He's fixed up his act, started touching grass, and bought some time before Riona catches a case. As we draw near to the end of the beginning, Ahito receives the new console and game from Riona. He's been preparing for this like League of Legends championships. With his new console, Hito boots up the game and logs in. And that's where season one ends. Thank you for watching if you made it this far. 
I actually strongly encourage everyone to fully watch the show. There were a lot of details and hints that really bring the story together and they couldn't all be included in a recap. I will admit, the show's consistency and development surprised me. So much to the point I went back to rewatch the older scenes to see just how much was foreshadowed. Well, if you enjoyed the video, leave a comment on whether or not you would give the game a try. Thanks for watching again.